So let's listen to Ave Maria. And I had to apologize because I'm on. I'm, I'm on, there's a lot of music in in this presentation, and I will have to stop and cut the flow of the music, unfortunately, so we can get through the whole thing. But I will share the PowerPoint with you with all the links, and you are gonna be able to listen to all of that later. So, uh, what is important to understand about these art songs is that the music. Melody, melody became very important in, in romanticism, and uh, just how you hear these beautiful lines created by the singing, uh, that's kind of the approach that Schubert got in, in his music. He wrote around seven symphonies that were complete. Of course, he wrote more than that, but like there were a couple moments here, and then he kind of uh, uh, recalled those symphonies and said, "I'm not going to publish that." And, and then some some musicologists found the uh, the manuscripts, etc. But I'm an, I, I want I want us to hear the symphony, the the unfinished. It's titled the unfinished. Is sometimes numbered uh, as number eight, and it's titled unfinished because it doesn't have four movements like most symphonies did at that time, but um, it is unclear wh whether um, he only he conceived only as a two movement thing or if he was planning to write all four movements and then he withdrew the project. What we do know is that he was working on a third movement but then he stopped he didn't orchestrate that and and he stopped um long story short we have two beautiful movements and uh we're gonna hear to the beginning of the first movement and i want to i want you to hear especially the melody try to identify melodies and singing lines and how they become be becomes so um, central to, to this music in comparison to, say, the Beethoven works that we heard uh, last week. So here we go. This is Symphony in B minor, number eight, if you will, by Franz Schubert. Some rhythmic agitation, but then it's melody again. into the second theme.
the same melody played by the violins. Anyway, you can totally see the, the influence of art song or, or just song, um, how not only it is like supremely melodic and, is, and it has this texture of melody and accompaniment, but you, you see the exact repetition of the melody that was in, in, in its full length, almost as if you sing, it, almost like if you're singing like strophic music or, you know, singing a, a stanza and then singing, singing the second stanza with different words, but the same melodies is the same idea, just like a song uh, would do. Um, so th th that is that is kind of like the world of French Schubert. Unfortunately, he died very young. He was... Um, I think like 30 something years old when when, when he died uh he he had he contracted a disease that was uh that didn't have any cure in in, in that time and his life was cut short um as i said just a, a year after beethoven but also around that time in a different town in germany in the city of leipzig we had felix mendelssohn an incredible prominent composer also died very young if you look at the timeline here born in 1809 died in 1847 uh, but unlike other composers he was a child prodigy and he was incredibly prolific early on he wrote a lot of pieces as a teenager when he was your age he was writing uh, these incredibly complex pieces um, in among many works, he composed uh, incidental music to A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, he wrote five symphonies, and uh, because his li his lifespan was so short, I you don't see um, uh, a progression of like a great change in his composition style. There is some, of course, naturally, but I would say. Personally, like his symphony number one is just as exciting as symphony number four. It has that beautiful light, lightness and um, um, uh, driving, uh, sparkling energy. Um, and it, it, it's a great composer. But I, I am not going to uh, make us listen to a symphony. In fact, I want to hear a concerto because we haven't had a time to talk about concerto all that much. And although the topic of our conversation is the development of the symphony, uh, concertos play, uh, ha have a, a, a great part in, um, in, in, in the symphonic repertoire. And concertos basically follow the same sonata form that we study in, in symphonies kind of like the large ABA form, um, except that in the classical era, you will have the exposition done twice, once by the orchestra and the second time with the soloist, or, um, meaning the soloist doing the exposition accompanied by the orchestra. So in other words, there was an orchestral introduction that had all the exposition materials before the soloist came in. Then came Felix Mendelssohn to say, to, to reject that rule, and he has the soloists introduce the, 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 the theme. So we have an introduction by the orchestra that lasts approximately a measure and a half before the, the soloist comes in with the theme. Um, just uh, as we can see here, uh, maybe it's a little sh shady, uh, make it here. Oh. We can see here it's a larger orchestra already. Um, we have timpani, we have, uh, we have the entire woodwind section. Generally for concertos, especially Mozart, Haydn, didn't use the entire woodwind section. He would use all instruments, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons. Uh, we have trumpets, we have timpani, we have horns. Okay, so let's listen to the beginning of the concerto, which is a great concerto. One of my, my favorite pieces. So youthful, so energetic, but 
again, drama, 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 drama. It's in E minor. And now the orchestra will take the theme. Anyway, another unfortunate uh, sudden stop that I must make. But as you can hear, the uh, just the, the general atmosphere, the general drama, the, the, the drive of the piece is just like so over the top, is so expressive. Um, this is not about uh, having a perfect balance form anymore. In fact, he, he breaks breaks with the form um, he breaks apart from from the, those formal structures that were in place uh, before him and he has the, the soloist introduced the theme as opposed as the orchestra as opposed to the orchestra introducing the theme and then being taken by the soloist um, another interesting thing about this piece is that all movements are uh, kind of like seamlessly uh, put together. In other words, there's no there's no uh, pause in between movement, which was another revolutionary uh, idea for the time. If you remember Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the third and fourth movement were linked. Well, Mendelssohn said, "I'm gonna link everything into one continuous thing." Just how you this is just so you understand how the long the big picture became much more important than uh than other uh, miniature structures for composers in the romantic area now we must go to richard wagner uh richard wagner was a uh very interesting figure um he did not compose symphonies, not as a mature, uh, he, he wrote uh, symphonies that were like exercise for composer, but like th that's not part of his like his um, persona as a mature composer. Uh, Wagner believed that um, music should serve a greater purpose and mu music should serve, uh, sh shouldn't be for the sake of music itself. That's the best way I can put it. Uh, it's not just music for the sake of music, but it's music to serve the greater good. And that greater good for him was the total artwork, or what he called in German, Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, which is an art form that combines music, poetry, visual art, those are paintings and like clothes and stuff, and drama, acting. In other words, Opera, but it, it, his opera wasn't the, the the same opera that you heard in Mozart. That was kind of like entertaining. Uh, this uh, this was like deep themes, like mythologic my, mythological, like Norse uh, topics and Germanic mythology. Um, anyway, so he believed so so deeply about this art form and he rejected music just for the sake of music like other composers did like for instance a symphony 
he believed that wasn't the real purpose of music and he thought he was the true carrier of the legacy left uh, by Beethoven when he uh, added text and the human voice in the ninth symphony and he believed to be the person that would embody that, uh, that trajectory that trend of going uh, for music for a greater good uh, orchestrationally uh, the orchestra just expanded its boundaries beyond its boundaries even he came up with uh, instruments like the Wagner tuba that was kind of like a horn but it's kind of like a euphonium it's, it's, it's a mixture of things uh, the orchestra be became even bigger uh, he redesigned the setup of a of a of, of, of an opera house um, it used to be in the times of Mozart, in the classical period, the opera house, uh, whatever happened on stage was just as important as whatever happened in in the audience seating, especially in this in in the front seats where the the, the people with the most money will sit and uh, uh, who sat with whom, which family was the guest of which family, uh, all those events. Uh, social events were just as important as the drama happening on stage. With Wagner, uh, he um, he created this um, opera house in Bayreuth in Germany that um, centered the entire evening, the entire attention of the evening to the stage. Even he covered like it, it, the the pit, the orchestra pit, kind of has like a cover structure for the conductor so the audience is not able to see the conductor because the action that happened on stage was it, it didn't didn't need any deterrence of attention in the world of Wagner anyway just like the orchestration grow bigger uh, the kind of like the mantra seems to be bigger is better uh, the orchestration got bigger the harmony get got so chromatic and uh, complex and the phrases got longer and uh, there was just more drama his pieces are very long uh, the culprit of his creation is perhaps the ring cycle which is a cycle of four operas um, that in total last 14 to 15 hours that are usually done in four evenings so um, uh, some some opera houses even do it once a week because not only they are so long they are also incredibly hard and demanding and they are very athletic for the human voice that you cannot see in this one uh, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because it's just like physically impossible. So you will do, you will take four Fridays in the month of April and and and, and do the ring cycle. Um, so that's kind of like uh, how how Wagner conceived this. And I want us to hear the Meister Singer Overture. This is the beginning of one of his operas, um, and you're just gonna appreciate the the orchestra that that that, that he used uh, you're gonna see the score here just the orchestra like the size of it just look at this score how how like this is just one page all the instruments like you have three like piccolo plus two flutes two oboes two clarinets four horns but soon three trumpets right we usually had two trumpets that usually went in tandem with the with the with the timpani now the trumpet the trumpets start gaining more uh power of their own three horns tuba which we haven't seen yet uh in in our presentations a, a ton of percussion in other uh, so let, let's hear this and then we'll talk So you're gonna hear here this melody, uh, kind of like the melody continues, although the instruments that play the melody drop, the, the same melody gets taken uh, by by uh, other instruments or other section of the instruments, creating this linear, continuous movement of the drama. 
that the, the the drama doesn't stop doesn't stop and, and like what we saw in schubert that you will have a bars and then the same a bars repeated just with different instruments wagner decides to have these long structures that are split into different instruments so here we go It's very busy. So here we have like this kind of like a fanfare like um, um, intervention of of the brass we have the trumpets and the and uh you know the the, the low brass and with the timpani is is it's a different role that uh, the brass had um in in the beethoven era where the trumpet basically doubled the timpani um anyway <laughs> this i i believe this opera the the meister zinger is around four and a half to five hours um so if you have time during a pandemic or something, I suggest you you watch that opera. Um, now we're gonna move on to the opposite camp, the camp that believe that actually music for the sake of music is the way to go, and it's uh, music shouldn't be used for uh, dramatic purposes or shouldn't be um, subordinate to other art forms but rather should be the absolute art form itself and therefore instrumental music um, should, should be should be at the center at the core of that and we have Johannes Brahms who was born in Hamburg but lived most of his life in Vienna he did not write operas and like Wagner and Wagner didn't write symphonies, so they were they couldn't be farther apart. And he also believed he was uh, he he carried Beethoven's legacy. I guess they each had their own interpretation what the future of music was and what Beethoven's intentions were. Um, that is so that he took more than 20 years to publish his first symphony because after Beethoven's ninth symphony nobody wanted to say this is how the symphony goes after that ginormous thing is it's like trying to uh you know Im Im imagine the, the the minnesota twins winning the world series three years in a row and then you you have to be the next head coach of them um you 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 have very big shoes to fill, um, and that's how Brahms felt, and and he he wanted to be recognized as Brahms, not as Beethoven. And in fact, people joked around at that time that that was Beethoven's tenth symphony. Brahms one was Beethoven's tenth. Um, anyway, so he was so self-conscious. First of all, uh, Brahms was very detail-oriented and very um, pristine about everything that he wanted it to be perfect nothing short of perfect and as i said it took him more than 20 years for him to 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 have the guts to say world this is my first symphony he did write for orchestra and he wrote serenades he wrote two beautiful serenades he wrote concertos if you listen to the uh, first piano concerto that is virtually a symphony that has a soloist that plays the piano uh, just like the way the, the orchestra works and the, the way uh, the thematic material is it moves around in the orchestra the the piano concerto is basically a symphony uh, the complexity of it he wrote overtures he wrote actually two very nice overtures uh, the academic festival overture and the tragic overture back to back 
beautiful orchestra work. So he knew how to orchestrate. He was a pianist, but he knew how to orchestrate and he knew how, how, how to use the orchestra. He just didn't, uh, I don't want to say dare, but he didn't dare to write a symphony, a piece that had the title symphony in it. And I, I want us to listen to the symphony number four, the beginning of it, because symphony number four is a great example of um, how the the complexity of, of 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 the musical language, how complex music language uh, got. Uh, as I said, Schubert like is this perfect, beautiful A bar phrases and then gets repeated. Well, we had the same uh, sort of miniature structures in earlier times, especially in Mozart, right? Well, we have a total, like here at the beginning of the fourth symphony in Brahms, we have a total avoidance of cadential points. Like Brahms doesn't want you to be satisfied too soon. He doesn't, he, he wants you to, to, to want more and he doesn't want to, to, he doesn't want you to feel at ease because the drama keeps evolving. The drama keeps moving forward. And look, it's a 40 minute symphony. He doesn't want you to be satisfied in the first 10 seconds. He doesn't want you to have a perfect authentic cadence in the first 10 seconds. So actually it takes, I believe 29 bars or something before you get an actual cadence. Um, and you're just gonna hear how things spin around and even get varied, there's variation. Okay, let's listen to the beginning of the first movement of Brahms' fourth symphony. Sorry to interrupt. You just see this falling figure, si, sol, mi, do, right? Descending, ascending, descending, ascending. He would just spin that out. He would just spin and spin and spin it. Like he will basically exhaust all the possibilities of that falling figure and rising figure. Let's do it again. Variations. It's very interesting to me. Brahms is a very uh, he he has the intellect, but he also has the heart in in in, in the piece. Like here, you clearly see that the music changes, but you don't feel at ease somehow. You don't feel at ease, and it's because like this high note sounds like it is on the first beat, but it's not on the first beat. So there's like that. Uh, that clash of, 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 of things in his music that makes you feel like not fully satisfied. It's like, yes, let's, let's, let's move on towards the second theme, but you didn't arrive with satisfaction uh, into a cadential point. Um, very interesting. And that is how he is able to move the drama forward in an incredibly, um, efficient, effective way. Okay, so that's Brahms. Now we're gonna jump ahead a little and we're gonna talk about nationalist composers. And of course we must talk about Antonin Dvorak. Uh, 
Dvorak was a Czech composer. He he uh, was born in what is today the Czech Republic, but back then was Bohemia. Um, he loved his country. He loved his country so incredibly much. Uh, he loved nature, uh, just like we were describing. He was one of the. He was the first composer of the first like renowned musician that came to work in the United States during their prime. A lot of composers came to guest conduct, to do one concert here, to do a, a mini mini tour, or, or they came to retire here. Dvorak came here at his prime because he was entrusted to create, to head a conservatory in, in New York. Um, and while he was in New York, uh, one summer he took he took off. I mean, it was the summer, and um, basically uh, he was allowed to come to the Midwest and and do a short trip. And he was and he was fascinated uh, by the idea of a Czech community in Iowa, in the middle of the United States. And on its way, on his way to Iowa, he quickly stopped. Uh, in Minnesota, and he visited Minnehaha Falls, that most of you, I, I believe, know, Minnehaha Falls. So you, if you go there, you're going to be standing on the same grounds that Dvorak um, visited. And then he, he spent a summer in Iowa. He very much loved the Midwest and loved the, how green things are in the Midwest and the nature, and and he, he saw that there were uh, many similarities with his uh, home bohemia in 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 czech bohemia um he didn't like new york he thought it was smelly he thought it was like uh messy but he loved the midwest very much um anyway so when he was in the in the united states he wrote his last symphony um symphony number no. nine um, and he titled it from the new world and he w when he was here he was uh, impressed by um, the uh, african-american spirituals that he was that he heard from his students uh, he i think he had one african-american composition student in new york who introduced him to this uh, spirituals and that genre of music and he was like very uh, impressed by that he also was impressed by uh the music of the native americans and and he thought that um, um he, he one of his his duties or like the hopes that the people that hired him in new york was that he will come help create an american musical identity a one unified american musical identity because back musical life in the u.s back then was very eurocentric we played com like orchestras here play composers from europe but there wasn't an a, an american sound uh, and and he was entrusted to do that and he said the heart of American music is in the Native American, Native American, and African American spiritual music, and um, and he found that actually it was it sounded very similar to Bohemian music. So he wrote this symphony from the New World that I believe you will recognize, and he said this is a Czech symphony. This is a symphony with Bohemian, a Bohemian sounding music because. Dvorak was a Bohemian composer, and he wrote uh, with Bohemian folk inspiration. That's what nationalist composers did. They took uh, music from the folk, music from the pe popular music, and he, they put it into this uh, serious uh, genre of symphonic music. And he said, but because I, I spent time in the U.S., I recognize that the Native American music and the African American spirituals have close similarities to Bohemian music. In other words, folk music kind of have like this uni at, at, at a very universal level. Uh, it's pretty much all the same around the world. It, it was his message. So I want I want us to hear the fur the the beginning of the fourth movement of this symphony. One of the great symphonies.
so just look at the dynamics here like every time there's a new entrance there's fortissimo 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 later in the piece you're gonna five, find three f's and actually in the beautiful uh, uh second movement you will find even three piece those dynamics were never used in the classical era no one dared to use that so just like the orchestration got more complex in the romantic era the harmonies too but also the dynamics they get they got more sophisticated there were different uh, degrees different uh, uh, sh shades of gray in the dynamic spectrum uh, that, 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 that were employed by composers because again they needed to be so specific because they just wanted to pour out their emotions like emotions like the stormy emotions messy emotions you know tragic emotions oh, of course joyful too i mean this symphony is pretty joyful um but the emotion became such a central part of, of individual emotion that is okay let's listen to a little more Anyway, this is a great symphony. I really didn't want to stop, but we must move on. You'll hear it during the summer. Um, so that is the music of Dvorak. And uh, again, he was asked, is this, uh, is this a collection of American themes? Uh, are, are, are you using themes that you heard, that you picked up in America? And he said, no, this is a Bohemian symphony inspired by what I heard in, in, in America, especially Native American music and African American spirituals, which are at the heart of American music. And where the, most of the raw material to create a, an American symphonic sound was. Of course, we cannot talk about romantic music without talking about Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Um, funny enough, uh, Brahms and Tchaikovsky were born on the same day, May 7th, just seven years apart. Tchaikovsky was seven years younger than um, Brahms. Uh, he was a representative of the nationalists in Russia, but it is interesting that in Russia there was this group of, 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 of called the Five, of five composers that accused Tchaikovsky on not being Russian enough in his musical creation and being so imbued in the music of the West. Um, he wrote, uh, in, in, he cultivated many genres, chamber music, uh, concertos, operas, tone poems. He was highly influenced by the writings of Shakespeare that you'll find a lot of Shakespeare inspired pieces uh, that even have the same title. You have Roman Juliet, you have Hamlet, uh, you have uh, other words that are not coming to my mind right now. Of course, he has the famous 1812 overture that he wrote that includes canons and church bells and whatnot. But he was also, he also thrived writing for ballet. I mean, there is an af a before and after in the ballet world. Uh, um, uh, before after Tchaikovsky um, and he kind of set the stage for all the ballets that the great ballets that came uh, with, you know with Balanchine and all those uh, Stravinsky in the in the 20th century he certainly set the stage for them and you have your Nutcrackers your Swan Lake uh, Sleeping Beauty all those great pieces of music just they are great pieces of music and when you put it with ballet they they become even better uh, but i want us to hear to the beginning of the fourth symphony he wrote six symphonies but the joke goes to say that he created three he, he wrote three symphonies number four number five and number six there is a disregard for the first three symphonies that, that tchaikovsky wrote i think there are good i i like symphony number two especially but what you hear most often programmed by orchestras in the world are symphonies four through six and the, for, for a good reason I mean they are great symphonies so I want us to hear this um, 
something that came whoa 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 something that came uh, very uh, intricate ab ab about the the romantic era is the 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 influence of of extra musical things into the music this symphony was originally conceived as a tone poem that will describe a story and uh tchaikovsky described this the theme that we're about to hear the theme with which the symphony opens as the fate motive and this is about fate again an extra musical meaning to a musical event um and that, that it came became increasingly important uh, in 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 music in the Romantic era. So here we go. This is Symphony Number no. Four. This undulation of D flat and C. And now comes the first theme with those two notes. A very interesting marking in Movimento di Valse. This totally doesn't feel like a, like a waltz. Uh, but that's what, what he wrote because I think he was interested in the tempo and the pull of, of, a, of a waltz. Very, very great, great piece. Again, 42 minutes. Um, so uh, I, 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 le I left the link for you there to, to, to hear later. So any questions? We, this is where I just uh, arbitrarily decided to stop uh, as far as history goes. There are many uh, great uh, romantic composers such as the one that we see here this is Gustav Mahler, who not only was like pretty much the best conductor of his time, he also was an incredible composer and who, who wrote revolutionary symphonies that I highly encourage you to, to, to hear. And, um, you know, his symphonies are actually like full evening events. Like most of his symphonies are over an hour in length and you don't want to hear anything before it and you don't want to hear anything after it. I mean, it takes such an emotional, uh, em emotional investment from your part uh, as a listener and uh, as a performer also to, to, that it takes a full evening just to process the entire thing. Um, and you can see the dramatic as it is depicted here in the in the painting i mean the orchestra looks like huge and crowded and at the center of it there's mr Mahler being a, a, a skilled conductor and keeping keeping track of everything going on you know there's a harp in the middle of it uh, you know uh, uh, double basses i'm pretty sure they're split there's a bunch here and there's a bunch in the other side and the timpani here going crazy uh, with the roles. I mean, su su such a dramatic painting that I think depicts very well the, uh, any musical event of a, of a symphony. Any questions? Any comments? Annalise, you look like you want to say something. No? Excellent. So guys, this is the last uh, the the last session of of the history of of music and appreciation. I invite all of you, if you haven't auditioned for Gitsis this year yet, that you submit your auditions. We have auditions uh, still uh, uh, for on a in a rolling basis, um, so so you can um, present your audition. Uh, for one of our ten orchestras in our system is an incredible opportunity for young musicians 
your age to grow and you know explore these pieces that we just talked about uh, today. Um, so it's a unique opportunity presented to you in, in the Twin Cities area. So thank you so much for joining us. I'll stick around if you'd like to talk about any of, the, of these things. And otherwise, thank you so much for participating today.